Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Greg Olson, and I'm the director of the New York State Office for Aging. I'm so glad you could join us today. This is a really, really important topic, and I'm so honored and privileged to be joined by three really amazing individuals, uh, but also state and national leaders. First is Al Cardillo, who is the president and CEO of the Home Care Association, who has been leading a New York State work group and has done a tremendous amount of, of work and provided incredible leadership in New York to address and try to mitigate and educate uh, around sepsis. And I'm also really privileged to have with me Karen and Orla Staunton, uh, who formed the Rory Staunton Foundation and End Sepsis in 2012, who are not only New York state leaders, but really national leaders. And we'll hear a little bit more about their story and how they got involved in this. Um, if you're like me, a couple of years ago, I knew what the word sepsis meant or was, but I actually didn't know, you know, the, the details of it. And so just by way of context, let me provide a little bit of background on why this conversation is so important um, and why we hope at the end of this, if you can share this recording with anybody and everybody that you know through all of your uh, social media and other types of, of channels. Sepsis is the body's overwhelming and life-threatening response to infection that can lead to tissue damage, organ failure, and death. In other words, it's your body's overactive and toxic response to an infection. Like strokes or heart attacks, sepsis is a medical emergency and it requires rapid diagnosis and treatment. Sepsis can lead to severe sepsis and septic shock. What your immune system usually does is works to fight germs like bacteria, viruses, and so on to prevent an infection. However, for reasons that researchers are still unaware of, sometimes the immune system stops fighting the invaders and begins to turn on itself. That's really the start of sepsis. Sepsis is the number one cost to hospitals and hospitalizations in the United States for acute sepsis hospitalization and skilled nursing care. And it's estimated to cost $62 billion annually. Sepsis is not about older adults. It can affect people of all ages. The very young, like infants and those who already have chronic health problems or compromised immune systems, are at much higher risk of developing sepsis. But people who are aging, particularly those 65 and older, those that have health issues and even are even more susceptible to sepsis than any other group. In fact, Individuals age 65 and older are 13 times more likely to be hospitalized with sepsis than adults younger than 65. And 63% who are admitted to an ICU, uh, intensive care unit, present with sepsis upon admission. Just a couple more stats and then we'll dive right into this. Older adults are two times more likely to result in a readmission uh, to a hospital than non-sepsis hospitalizations. More than 40% of older patients have had another hospitalization within three months of their initial sepsis diagnosis. Nursing home residents are six times more likely to present with sepsis in the emergency room than non-nursing home patients. And 20,000 new cases of moderate to severe cognitive impairment occur every single year in older adults, specifically caused by sepsis. So those were things that I didn't know and when I, learned about those and I really um, you know, thank Al for that. It was something that we immediately had to jump into to action. Um, it has a personal impact as well as the impact that our office can have on providing outreach and education and training to uh, people that work in the community or the community in general, because this is something if you know the signs and symptoms can save your life. The day that Al had sent me some resources on signs and symptoms, um, saved a staff person's life uh, that worked in my agency. I have since known 13 people who have died of sepsis um, and one who was saved last week uh, in my office, again, because of sharing the general basic information so that folks don't fall through the cracks. Under Governor Hochul's leadership, September of 22 was designated as Sepsis Awareness Month because she understands the devastating impact, both short-term and long-term um, of sepsis, how much it costs, the impact on families. And so we thank her for, for that leadership. Um, and while we were advertising this today, um, we had some really interesting feedback from individuals in the community. And I just would like to read a couple before I turn it over to, to Al Cardillo. 
So somebody had wrote in, I had sepsis, was hospitalized a week, then had emergency surgery, nursing care, and I was out of work for four months. One person wrote, I almost died from this deadly disease twice, three years apart. Many people do, famous or not, rich or poor. This disease does not discriminate. Know the symptoms. If you have them, get to a hospital. There's very limited time to save your life. The worst part of the recovery from this is regaining your strength. Watch this program. I am going to watch it and, and I will be much more aware of this and better informed than most. Be afraid, be very afraid. And then finally, I was hospitalized a month with sepsis and sent home with IV antibiotics. My brother had sepsis, wound up with a trach and on dialysis. My niece's sister died from sepsis. It's no joke. So Al, that's really what we're dealing with. And that's what you had, um, you know, I'm so thankful that you had brought me in, um, in our capacity as somebody that has a, you know, small agency, but a large community footprint. And I know that a lot of the work that you've done and the coalition that you brought together um, in New York State has been focusing a lot on the clinical care community, uh, rightly so, right? Um, and I think that uh, progress has been made over the last five, seven, 10 years in outreach and awareness, but there's so much more that we can do. So first start with why should the general community, anybody, um, in, in, including um, healthcare providers, community-based organizations, or just people who are walking down the street, uh, why should they be focusing on uh, sepsis and the signs and symptoms of sepsis? Well, thank, thanks, Greg. And I, I, I just really want to commend you and the Office for Aging for your leadership uh, in this area. Karen and Orla Staunton uh, just have been the, the inspiration for really everything that's gone on here uh, in New York. And, and I know that they'll be telling a very profound story coming up. But I, I also want to acknowledge the comments from those who sent their testimonials to you. Those conversations and, and those comments, I think, can be the most powerful motivators as to addressing your question as to why this is so important. They tell that story exactly. And, and I know that as we've done community sessions in education, uh, Karen has basically addressed the audience of professionals and, and, and educators and others that are there saying, when was the last time you used the word sepsis? Have you used it today? The more you use it, the more people will ask and the more they'll know. Coming to coming to the, the uh, further on your question, it's it's important because uh, as what you outlined, a healthy person, someone who is who is young, vibrant, can be brought down in a matter of days, hours, because they have an infection that has progressed to sepsis. Uh, we also know, however, that is it is very common in populations that 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 have compromises either because of age, a chronic illness, a disability, fragility if you're a child. Uh, it's the, it's the uh, second leading cause of death for, for, in maternal mortality. Um, so it's, it's, it's all around us. A big part of the issue is the word is so rarely used that the awareness is not really at the level that it has to be, though that has improved greatly over the last decade. So, so at the community level for the general public, it's very important to be aware of this. And just as you said earlier, similar to heart attack, stroke, and other kinds of other kinds of conditions. But I think the other very important element um, is the fact that professionals uh, need to be on the same page with regard to sepsis and sepsis care, because so often it's a matter that uh, an individual uh, uh, um, has a, has evaluated a patient, but but has determined that, well, maybe it's a bug, maybe it's the flu, or maybe it's something you can just go home and, you know, take care of in this way, it'll get better. And very often that's not the case and the patient ends up crashing. The other issue is, is that time is so significant with regard to sepsis and intervention. And one needs to have the a, a, a really a common set of practice principles uh, from one provider to another when a, a person is suspected with sepsis. So if somebody is, let's say, an older person and is in home care, and you, you think that the patient might have a UTI, they have a fever, there are some altered mental state, um, and there's a conversation with the doctor, those providers have to be on a similar page that these could be signs and symptoms of sepsis. So let's say the physician orders uh, a, a, a transport to the ER. 
Well, the EMS has to be in the equation and on the same page. Then meanwhile, a, a, a contact to the emergency room on report has to indicate, I have someone with me, we suspect sepsis because we don't want someone who has those symptoms sitting in an ER for six hours waiting to be seen. So, so, so really it's incumbent on every sector and every, really every individual and advocate within the public to be aware of this, to spread that awareness and for professionals to work together to get on the same page, which we're trying to uh, really uh, promote very heavily in our association and with colleagues across the field. Yeah, and I think you, you know, the three of you among, and then others like the Sepsis Alliance and many, many other partners uh, have made tremendous inroads, but it's still, as you mentioned, um, you know, the, the number of uh, professionals and non-professionals alike that still overlook this, right? And, and um, it, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. You talked about time. So I'm going um, to mention that word and that how fast, you know, this, as you mentioned, can devastate you um, as an individual and of course, as, as a family. Uh, but there's also a, a, a piece that's called time that can help people remember what the signs and symptoms are. And they may not be all the signs and symptoms. So I'll ask all of you if anything's missing from this, but can, you know, the million dollar question is what are the signs and symptoms? And there's a, you know, there's a time piece here. Can you walk kind of through what the general signs and symptoms are because I worry you know, now that we're in September and going into October, November, December, I mean, there's a lot of, of things out there from COVID to the flu to uh, just, you know, general colds that people get where this could be, um, this could be overlooked. And if, if we don't address it quickly in time, um, you know, the, the, uh, the outcomes can really be devastating. So Greg, so mortality from sepsis increases uh, an average of four to 9% for every hour the treatment is delayed. So it's very, very critical whether somebody's in community or like I said earlier, even if they're in the ER, they need to be seen and, and they, they need to be evaluated. Uh, this mnemonic was created by Sepsis Alliance um, and uh, it's really an attempt to try in and in in I think in a very plain way to have folks alerted to what, what the cluster of symptoms symptoms could be or signs could be that might be indicative of, of, uh, of, of sepsis. So it's not a diagnostic instrument by any means, but it's something that cr creates that level of awareness. And I think one of the immediate challenges is as you look across each of these criteria, so temperature, infection, mental decline, and extreme pain, they could all be indicative on their own of something to be concerned about. Um, uh, but they also, they also on their own, maybe something that suggests to the individual or even a practitioner that it's something else, that it isn't sepsis. So, but, but what's really important is to, is, is first of all, to take each one of these seriously, but also as you progress uh, in the cluster of these signs to understand the seriousness of when they're combined. So temperature. It could either be a very high temperature or a very low temperature. Someone could feel cold. They could actually be shivering. Um, and and that, that would be an indicative of one sign. Sepsis always has to have the, uh, you know, the co-occurrence of an infection. Um, it, it, and it could be any infection. It could be a, a, a tick bite. It could, it could be the flu, you know, uh, it, it could be anything. One of the issues, however, is that sometimes a person doesn't know that they have an infection. They have a sore site, maybe it's something orthopedic, uh, and they're not aware that, that, that an infection is actually occurring. Um, so it's, it's important to be aware of all these signs. But if you do know you have an infection and you have these other symptoms, you really have to be on, on higher alert. Mental decline, being confused or sleepy or not, in, uh, uh, unresponsive, that's a very, very critical clue, clue and especially in the elderly uh, and older individuals where very often, uh, or, or in a person who has special needs, there's a there is a, a not, not there's not necessarily a, a serious take on the mental function as it might relate to sepsis, but it might be you know uh, even family might attribute it to another characteristic of the person. And then of course, extremely ill, and and you will hear individuals who have ex who have experienced sepsis tell you that th that they have never felt that ill in their entire life, the worst pain ever, and. You know that was that was very out.
eloquently uh, presented by Alan Filler in our sepsis summit in June, where he described the enormous pain that he felt in sepsis. So I, I know that uh, that Karen and Orliff will, will, will want to uh, add to this discussion. And so let me um, let me uh, pass the mantle to them. Yeah, that, that would be great. So any other additional signs and symptoms that people should be aware of besides the, the quick time sheet? Sure, I think one of the really important um, points that Al made, um, like as a parent sitting there looking at your child or, or as a loved one, you don't know sometimes if they have an infection or not. We didn't know if our son had an infection or not, but we, what we could see was that he was shivering and he seemed to be very cold and we couldn't we couldn't sort of put that into any box. And it was only um, afterwards that we realized it was one of the symptoms. The other thing that he really had was he had mottled skin. I had never seen mottled skin before, but I knew there were like blue veins on his hands and I had described them to several people and nobody knew what I was talking about. So I think fever, shivering or feeling cold, pale and mottled skinned. Um, I think that the, the the confusion and the disorientation is very important. Um, our son used to, believe it or not, at 12, his favorite TV show or any of the TV shows that were on CNN were his favorite. He wouldn't even watch it that day. And I remember thinking there's something really strange about that. He didn't want to watch anything, didn't want to read, didn't want to do anything. And obviously, um, he had an elevated heart rate and he had rapid breathing. And all of that combined was just as as, as one of your your listeners or your viewers said, um, be afraid, be very afraid if you see all this together because it is one in five people do not survive septic shock. And um, so I think putting it all together, it is a picture that I think you can see clearly if you know what you're looking for. Yeah, so let, let's um, let's move into that because we talked a little bit in the beginning um, that this is uh, this does not discriminate based on age. There are folks that are more susceptible than others based on health and condition, et cetera. Um, but I, I've had um, you know such a fortunate opportunity to meet uh, the two of you, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Stanton, and listen to your story um, and what your story has led to in terms of your advocacy. So for those who you know, we could piggyback up on your last sentence, be afraid, be very afraid. Tell us um, if you wouldn't mind. I know this story is emotional for me to listen to it. I can't even imagine how it is for you to, to talk about it as a, you know, a father of uh, small kids myself. But tell us what happened uh, to, to Rory and, you know, why we're here. I mean, this is, it's just so important. Sure. Um... Well, our son Rory was, um, he was 12 years of age. Um, he was uh, five foot nine, 160 pounds, big kid, very healthy. Um, loved riding his bike, was just the regular kid on the block. We lived in Queens. Um, and um, one day he came home from school and he mentioned to me that he had fallen during a basketball game and he showed me a bandaid on his elbow and um, he, the way he put it was, mom, I got the ball. Like it was kind of a, you know, a great deal that he had, he'd fallen to get the ball. And, um, but he seemed fine. And then uh, we went to bed, he went to bed that night. And um, during the night I heard him, um, you know, uh, moaning and, and and not being well. And um, the, the following morning, um, Kieran and I, um, we uh, tried to get in touch with his pediatrician because we knew he had a temperature. Um, we finally got to to meet her that evening, and um, she did um, a, you know a check of of his symptoms. And though I remember vividly trying to kind of catch her eye when she was you know um, checking his heart rate and kind of going you know is it okay is it not okay sort of thing just so he wouldn't um, know um, you know what I was trying to do. At that point, he was complaining about a pain in his leg. He was really uh, was not well. He was throwing up. Um, and so she told, um, you know, Kieran and I told her how concerned we were about him and how we had never seen him like this before. As I mentioned, he was, you know, just, he just wasn't himself. He was disorientated and, and he was in so, so much pain. So um, we asked like why the pain in his leg? Uh, she said she thought he had a, a stomach virus. 
And um, she said she had seen it all around New York and that um, he had the same symptoms of, as everybody else that would come to her, her office. And so I remember asking her about the pain in his leg and why would the pain in his leg, you know, have to do with a stomach virus? And she said, oh, that was definitely from the fall when he fell playing basketball. And like Rory was, was quite vocal himself um, at the time. And he said, no, 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 I didn't hurt my leg that bad when I fell. And actually at that point, um, the blue lines were beginning to show up on, on his tummy. And um, I asked her about those and she dismissed those as well um, and said, you know, it's fine. You know, what, what we do need to do is we need to get him to the hospital in order to have him rehydrated. And, um, but she said, don't worry about it. It's fine, I've seen this before. So we went from her office, which was just a couple of blocks away from um, here in, in Manhattan to the, the hospital that she sent us to. Um, there they um, gave him um, IV fluids and um, they concurred with her diagnosis of a stomach virus um, and they sent us home um, with Rory and um, so he was he was really still very 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 sick um, and he began throwing up in the bathroom and she had told us he would continue to throw up she had told us that this was how the um, you know the virus follows its track. And um, so the next day um, on a Friday, he'd fallen on the Wednesday on the Friday, he was very, very, we felt he was still very ill and we started calling her and finally she told us to bring him back into the hospital. Um, we brought him back into the hospital and um, they brought him straight away to ICU. That was on a Friday night. And um, I, can't, I can't tell you how good they were in the ICU as you all know from, from, from you know, being with, with these people who work in hospitals and that, they were just amazing. They were like a second family to him and to us. Um, and that was Friday night and he died on Sunday. Um, and during that whole time we were in the hospital, they never mentioned sepsis to us. They mentioned nothing to us. They never mentioned our previous visit to the hospital. They mentioned nothing. They did mention infection um, and they had asked me, you know, had he any breaks in his skin? And I pointed to his arm and they said, no, that, that's not of any, issue no worries to us there um, and so so what we discovered afterwards was that oh, I'm so sorry um, what we discovered after was that that um, when Rory went to his pediatrician he was actually in septic shock when we brought him to the emergency room they gave him IV fluids but they failed to give him antibiotics which would have saved his life um, they took blood tests but they they failed to read the blood tests themselves and even after Rory was discharged, they failed to, to contact us to tell us that his bloods were pretty much off the char charts. They were showing signs of serious infection. And so we, we had no idea how sick he was. Um, and we had never heard of sepsis. It was only after he died that um, somebody mentioned sepsis to us. It was another doctor from a different hospital. And we were like, what the heck is sepsis? We'd never heard it. Uh, bear in mind too, when Rory was sick, I had checked him for meningitis. I actually stripped him down. He was 12 years of age, big kid. It was very, very hard to do it with him. I actually stripped him down and, and looked to see, did he have a bug bite anywhere? Um, I was just desperate. I kind of knew something. I knew something was wrong. And so did Kieran. And, and, but we couldn't, there was, we couldn't put our finger on anything because we didn't know about sepsis. And so, um, so after he died, um, you know, we discovered all of this. Um, this was, you know, already known to people that that there was something out there called sepsis. That two hundred seventy five thousand people die of sepsis every year, and and so I'm going to go back to saying that we were afraid. We were very afraid those couple of days, but we didn't know about sepsis, so there was nothing we could do. That when we look at it now, we didn't know what we were dealing with. So that is our message to everybody know the signs like Al said, and be prepared to be your own advocate because it, it is time, you, you're, it's a race against time to get the care that you need to ensure that your loved one makes it out the door of a hospital. Yeah, I really appreciate you sharing your story again. I mean, it's just it's devastating to, to listen to. And, you know, you guys lived, you know, through something that I think as a parent, anybody would say something's not right here. And what you were getting back certainly didn't sound right. And within mm -hmm. a matter of days, a healthy 12 year old boy 
uh, it's no longer with us. I mean, it's just, it's, it's de devastating. Mm -hmm. um, can you guys talk about um, end sepsis, which you established in 2012, as well as the Rory Staunton Foundation, and the steps that you've taken to be uh, real leaders in New York to make some changes so that other families, regardless of age, don't have to go through what you went through? Well, I think, Commissioner, and thank you very much for your leadership on this, and thank you very much, Al, for coming on board and your leadership. I think it's hard to go back to this, but as you said earlier, sepsis is an equal opportunity killer. It's just, it's equal opportunity. I mean, this young man here, Rory Staunton, that was a young, fine young man, right? No one knew about sepsis. There was nothing on the internet. It was killing, as Ola said, 270 to 300,000 Americans a year. We went on the CDC website after Rory died. There was nothing on the A to Z for sepsis. We met, we went to, D, to, to Atlanta. We met with Tom Friedman, the, the head of CDC. There was no paperwork in the, in the CDC offices. We brought in pamphlets like this and brochures about sepsis. That was the only information that was there. So, so then we found out that had we gone to the hospital that Rory had been born in up the street that we normally would go to, they had sepsis watch at the front door. So Rory would be alive today. So then we, we obviously, as we said, we started looking around and we said there was nothing on the internet. There was no leadership. There was no one out there. It was killing all those people. Government wasn't involved in it. Agencies weren't involved. Foundations weren't involved. Um, there was no one there. And I mean, we didn't actually, we, one of the things we went to, we commissioned uh, our own graph and polling. You'll see on the red line there, I was, many people at Kills of Comparison to prostate cancer, AIDS and breast, it kills more than all of them. And we went to Washington and we met the United States Senate leadership. There was a hearing on sepsis, the first ever in Washington. And we produced that for, for leadership. And we kept asking, why, where is it? Is the state government responsible, city government, hospitals? Who is it? There wasn't any answers. So we met actually with Northwell Health and Michael Dowling, and they actually were leaders. They had the gold standard. They cut sepsis fatalities by 50% in five years. So we were saying, well, but there's a template there. So why doesn't everyone do this? Uh, we met with the New York State Department of Health, uh, Commissioner Shah, and we met with Governor Cuomo's office. And we were saying, well, well why is this? Why does a young man like Rory is allowed to die and no one knows what it was and no one was worried? And we then found there was no one in charge. There was no, we were it. So we decided we'd set up a foundation. We would set up an organization. We would see to it in New York state and nationally. And we have become national leaders on the issue. We've testified on many publications. We're on today's show and we've been on People Magazine and others. And we don't think that any parent should have to buy a coffin for their 12 year old child, but something that's totally preventable. And if there's a hand wringing exercise going on by while well, the politicians didn't know and the community didn't know and the various people didn't know. And we got Rory's regulations and we'll talk about that in a minute. We got them passed in New York where it's signed by Governor Cuomo and Commissioner Shah. And between 2014 and 2019, we have saved 16,000 lives in New York alone. Now, there was the template out the door. So we went to other states and we traveled to many capitals and we said, well, here's a template that's saving lives. Why don't you do it? And obviously vested interests and lobbies worked against it. We went to the, the, the nation's capital, obviously. And um, we the other thing I saw we got together was that the various national agencies, not alone did CDC have it on their A to Z, but the various agencies weren't talking to each other about it because it wasn't an issue. So we decided we put a forum together and we bring all the national uh, leaders together and government and all in the one room in Washington. And we said, every year we're putting you all together. We want reports. The CMS came back and credited us for putting them, putting them uh, interest in it. Fair play, Dr. Frieden did eventually post that we were responsible for getting them to move and finally putting it on their A to Z. And by pulling them together every year, Jim Dwyer wrote a big piece in the New York Times, we found out that we were actually getting people interested. We were getting the word out that we, every door we came to, we had to knock it open. There was no door open to us. 
And I'll tell you how far it's come to write just two weeks ago at the United States Senate, and you know how divided it is at the moment, um, partisan, partisanship. Senate Leader Schumer and Minority Leader Blunt co-sponsored a resolution designating uh, September 13th uh, sepsis, uh, National Sepsis Day. That's on that issue alone. But what we keep coming back to, there was no one there. There was no one private, public, or anyone else. And I've often said, for people to sit into our shoes, on the Tuesday evening, Rory and I went into the pizza store and they asked him what type of pizza did he want. The following Tuesday, I was in a funeral home in Queens asking me what type of coffin did I want. And then we had to go, and I said this to the CDC, why is it left to those who have buried a loved one to have to go to mobilize the nation and bring in your regulations and push every door and do uh, pay for public service announcements, put up websites and all that, and meet with yourselves and Al and plenty of others. But the, the bottom line is there was no one there. We have met some of the people whose lives Rory has saved. It shouldn't have happened. And the, the whole issue I think going forward is, is that the number is increasing. Three and a half million Americans have died of sepsis since Rory died. That's criminal. And I'll actually pass it back if you want. I know I've gone on a bit, but I think that's that was how we got it going. We got in sepsis, it's a 501c3. I think it's we're recognized leaders, not alone in, in domestically, but, but internationally. I just came back from Berlin on, on this issue where we got met with the WHO on it. But again, there was no one actually inviting you in on every state, national or otherwise. So I'll pass it back to you again, Commissioner, I went on a bit. So, um, Karen, can you can you show that chart that you had showed us briefly and put it up to your camera and walk folks through a little bit higher? Because, you know, you, the, the history and what you guys had to deal with is devastating enough. But then you look at the data and how there's there was little to no action when you present data like this is something I, I will never quite understand. And. You know, thanks to you guys, but 16,000 people's lives have been saved. It's just, it's, a, it's amazing um, the, the passion and commitment for what you guys have done. But just so folks can see what the big red block is and what the ones, the three on the left are. And just put that next for us. Yeah, the little one on the very bottom that you can hardly see, believe it or not, is AIDS which is now down at less than 15,000 annually. The next one is prostate cancer. The next one is breast cancer. And you can add in the Ebola. And the four of them together don't reach the top of the one called sepsis. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. So, Al, you know, back to you. I mean, you know, when it's, it's, hard, it's hard not to follow the lead of the Stauntons. I mean, I, I just don't know how... Um, you know, the work that, that you're doing with the Stauntons and others, with the clinical care community, you know, th those things take time. And I think you've made a tremendous uh, amount of progress collectively. I mean, the three of you and then others, uh, again, it's, it's uh, all hands on deck. Um, but the, the, the need to really focus in on the general public um, who knows like the signs of stroke, for example. Um, but then you look at that graph and, you know, you focus in a lot on home care, but the coalition that you've put together uh, is just so broad and diverse and covers so many different areas. Um, why, why did you initially focus on, on the home care sector? Well, first of all, because 87% of sepsis cases originate in the community, the home and community, just like the story that Oral and, and uh, Kieran just told with regard to Rory. Um, it, it is typically believed, you know, and misunderstood that, oh, sepsis is something you get when you go to the hospital, mm -hmm. you know, and that is, is one of the things that becomes that, uh, that blinder in effect or that lack of information is one of the most deadly misunderstandings associated with this whole thing. When we first started out uh, making inquiries um, about this and, and, you know, to what extent was it prevalent in the home, in the community, and that was before I saw those statistics. 
the, you know, the feedback that we got was, well, it's a very serious problem, but it's really an issue in the hospitals. It's not really in our domain. Um, but then when we saw statistics, you know, 80 to 90 percent originates in community. It's the number one cause of readmission. And I sat there looking at these the statistics and saying, well, if you're being readmitted with it, if 87% occurs in the community, how can this not be a community issue? So in looking then more deeply at the population where of high risk, and I went through those categories earlier, they really mirror the population that home care e either cares for or could care for, and not just home care, but other community agencies. It's, it's sort of right there within your grasp. Um, and you know when you when you see the data and you listen to Rory's stories and you 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 understand the devastation, you say to yourself as a professional, as a leader in areas of the field, how can I not do something about this? We have to do everything we can. So in our effort and really building on the lead that that that, that Karen and Orla had established with the protocols, we look to see you know what. What could home care do? How can we possibly make an impact in this area? So one of the clinicians that we drafted to be part of this process, who was, who was very passionate about it, Amy Bowerman, she's mm -hmm. the director uh, out at the Mohawk Valley Health System uh, in Utica, had, had actually worked to implement sepsis protocols in her hospital. She was also responsible for the home care agency and for the managed care plan. So with Amy's involvement, uh, involvement with the Dr. Dorfler, uh, who was at Northwell, uh, working with the Stauntons, Dr. Steve Simpson, who was the chief medical officer, you know, uh, for Sepsis Alliance, and Tom Heyman, the director. So we all sort of got together and said, how can we, mm -hmm. how can we follow a course here? Uh, and so with that, we were able to build, build a, a protocol and an assessment tool uh, and a training plan for home health across the state. Uh, and, and I have to say that that many of the people who participated in our training in which Karen and Oral uh, were, were a, a primary people in said that, that, that some of their prime motivation was hearing what they had to say. Um, and, and because initially we had, to, we had to work with the inertia, even within our own field, that this was a hospital problem, not a community problem. And, and, but again, time and again, individuals said, when I heard that story, I too knew that I had to act. So, so I think that, you know, when you look at it and you look, again, you look at the plethora of, of, of individuals that are impacted, you look at, again, we know that this can be, this has to be, a, as, as, as Karen said, this is an equal opportunity killer. So everybody's got to be aware, but say within the, within the field of, of what we do, your aging services community, Greg, folks have to be at the high level of vigilance. And, and the thing is, is, is that, it, you know, on a Monday, uh, someone could visit a, 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 an individual, um, uh, particularly an older person, and they could seem fine. The next day, they could be showing signs and symptoms of, of sepsis. And we found that in, in, our, in our own processes. <clears throat> so that vigilance has to really be across the board. Um, and, and really, we encourage, we encourage, we're encouraging every home health agency, every home care agency, every community agency to work with us implement the tool that, that we've created. And if not, go to something that works for you, but by all means, in legacy to Rory Staunton, do it. Yeah, and absolutely. I just also add there, um, uh, because I, I really do want to do kudos to New York State Department of Health. Um, they have been a really great partner to us. Um, their first um, you know, their first question was, what could we do to ensure that Rory Staunton doesn't happen again in New York State? And they put together a, a, a whole initiative with us where the, the hospital associations, us as parents and um, doctors all sat down and said, what can we do to make this better? And that's how Rory's regulations, which are are, are, are set of protocols that hospitals must have to, to deal with sepsis cases, um, came about and and also they we also introduced a a pa parents bill of rights because what we found and I think this is something that everyone finds that when you're in an emergency room it's high pressure and we found particularly with our son that we couldn't ask the questions in front of him that we really wanted answers for and also the fact that he was he was um, you know discharged from the hospital and they hadn't read his blood work. So in New York State now, there is a parent's bill of rights where 
whereby the, the hospital must advise you on, on um, any blood tests that were taken, um, on, on what they think that your, the patient is suffering from or any other diagnosis they might be considering. And also that it's, it's uh, your discharge, um, you know, your discharge uh, points are all, all clearly read to you. Um, and so when we looked at it, we were like, okay, like Al said, um, that we have the, the hospitals are on board. And then we thought, you know, our children come home to us and they talk to us, uh, used to talk to us, Rory used to talk to us, Kathy still does, about everything from school. And we looked at all the textbooks and there was nothing in there. There was stuff in there about diabetes, there was stuff about everything. But it's very selective what they teach your child in school. And they had nothing in it about sepsis. And so what we did was we worked with the American AFT and we put together um, a curriculum of sepsis. And what we found was that, you know, in going to the schools, that a lot of the children, the older children are actually the caregivers for the younger kids in their homes. And so by getting them used to the word of sepsis and to looking out for infections and all of that, we knew that this would make a difference. And so New York State Department of Education jumped in and made that curriculum available to all schools throughout the state. And, um, you know, we still we still get letters um, and we have several students that take it up as a, you know, their their Red Cross or their, um, you know, whatever organizations they're in, uh, little projects for that. So I completely agree with both of you that it has to be community. And Al is absolutely right. 87 percent of it happens within a community. So seeing that person every day, like the Home Healthcare Association, um, or if, if, if you're just, you know, if your dad or your mom or isn't feeling well that, you know, just watch for that little difference because that's, what's going to actually make the difference between life and death for them in some cases. So. Yeah. And that, that one statistic is how we got involved. Um, <laughs> again, we were not, we don't oversee the clinical care community, obviously work every day throughout New York state with a variety of providers, but we're in the community. And so, you know, I, I think back to both of your points, um, all three of you, and the reaction from the health department and the Department of Education, I'm not surprised, right? Because that's exactly the right question when you see the data is what can we do? If the answer is we're not doing anything, I think we've all said that it's time to, you know, move on to, and do something else and let somebody else come in. Uh, because these are a call to action. I mean, like I said, we are a very small state agency, but we have a huge community footprint through a variety of different partners. So in addition to having our own home care program in concert with many of Al's members, but, but others as well, we have home delivered meal providers, transportation providers, senior center staff, um, you know, transportation staff, on and on and on. And then you multiply that by all the other agencies out there that touch a family um, th this should be an all hands on deck. And I think what you guys have been able to do with the regulations, the Bill of Rights, the Department of Education, Al, we just got, uh, you know, noticed that um, um, the Home Care Association of New Jersey is following the lead of New York is really a testament to, to all of, of your guys' great leadership. And I'm proud to be, you know, to, to be a part of New Yorkers to see what's right in front of them and then you know say i have to do something so you know for the for the stauntons let's talk about self-advocacy because that's not always an easy thing to do to interact with uh professionals who you know think they know best think they know everything and certainly that's not everybody but we've all had that as experience so for the folks that are listening today, regardless of age or will be in the coming weeks, and there'll be thousands of people that will view this, um, what, what's your message to uh, families, to friends, to individuals, to community-based organizations regarding this issue and how they can advocate for themselves? Karen, I think you have a brochure there that we that we did a list. What, what we did is um, going back to the original paperwork. We said we'd try and make it make it as simple as possible. One of the brochures that's on our website is "Be an Advocate, Empower Yourself and Others." And one of the things, and I just go back to this, and I'll go back for one second, is protocols or anything along those lines must be mandatory. What we often have to remind people is that the hospital that Rory died in had the sepsis program, but it was voluntary and it didn't kick in. 
and Rory's dead. So voluntary doesn't work. So it has to be mandatory that they must do, this must be written down, here's what you must do. So we also found out that a lot of professionals weren't aware of sepsis. So what we also did, I'll just go back to this, in 2017, in New York State passed Rory Staunton's law that requires all professionals to take a course in sepsis prevention. And today it's over 488,000 professionals in New York have actually studied and taken some courses in sepsis. I mean, that will help people when they go in. But by not asking straight away, we say rule out sepsis. And it is not to be afraid to be your own advocate or your child or your loved ones. Um, they say, ask a doctor if your temperature, your pulse or, or anything is normal. Make sure the other one is that Rory's bloods were ordered stat. Meant that they knew there was something wrong, but that was the end of it. We never heard any more about his blood till, till after he was dead. That if there are bloods taken, we ask, well, why are they taken? Are the results back? And it is also very important that your own doctor receives the results, but that you don't leave the hospital with a loved one, with yourself, whether you're the advocate or not, and it's not always being easy, that you're not satisfied that you are fine. If there's anything wrong, which is, and all you've got to say, and I had a friend the other day called in and they asked the doctor to come over, they just had a baby, and said, is it possible that I have sepsis? Well, it's a yes or no. It's, it's not, could be, if there's a question mark, then you treat with it. And I, I think, and especially as you, many of us know right now, the number of baby boomers and coming on side and reaching that age where, again, their system is not as strong as it should be. Take, for instance, former President Bill Clinton, who recently survived sepsis and was very ill with it. So people of that age upwards, are there's no second chance. At it. Once they go in, and if it's not treated in the very beginning, then the system is gone. So our thing going back continuously is, and what you need to know is, it's not sepsis, or it is sepsis. Because... One of them is fine and the other one's a headstone if you're not careful. Well, thank you for that. And I believe that um, we have that information into the chat to make sure that people have the resources, <coughs> excuse me, that you're talking about. Um, can you tell us, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you each to um, answer this out of your own lens. Um, tell us about the, the, um, your National Family Council on Sepsis and how people can get involved. From your perspective, and then Al, I'd like to follow up to say for anybody here that's listening in New York State, um, you know, what your recommendations are on not only helping spread the word, but really how to get involved so we can continue to build this strong coalition so that the types of experiences that um, happen to the Staunton family do not happen to other families. So why don't we start with the, the National Family Council on Sepsis. Sure. Um, well, we formed the National Com Family Council on Sepsis. Um, as a result of our story being heard throughout the, the United States, we heard from a lot of other families who had very similar um, occurrences happen to them. Um, and, and I know this is something that, that everybody here um, has, has, has felt, but I have never felt anything like the pain I felt when my son died. And um, it, it doesn't go away, it stays with you forever. So. One of the things that I know that does help is this advocacy. Yes, I want to make things better for everybody else, but I have to feel I'm doing something. And I think that is a common um, sort of uh, message that we can put out there and help people feel and do something about. So we formed the National Family Council and it's, um, it's basically a very large group of families from all over America, some who have lost um, siblings, some who have lost fathers, mothers, and many who have lost children. Um, and what we do is we stay in touch with each other um, and we also, as, as we will be continuing on a lot of efforts here on a, on a federal level, they will be our foot soldiers, they, we will be foot soldiers together with this, um, with this cause because, and, and we keep saying this, but it's just unreal, the data that's out there about sepsis. And the only way that we have found that we can make it real to many, many people is to tell our stories. And then sometimes you see the light go on and it's like, oh my goodness, that could happen to me. And um, so that's what the Family Council is, is about. Um, if you'd like to join it or if you'd like to 
share your story, which is really very important because even the stories or the, the comments that you read out at the start, Greg, like it, people have so many stories of how this has affected them. So um, you can also share your story on our website and we, we spread it out. We have a very, very large group of social media followers. We, we spread it out there as well. And I think it's really important. It's important for the rest of the rest of the population to know what's happened to us. And it's important for people to hear your story, your individual story, so that it makes you a better advocate too. I mean, you know, I was, I, I thought I was a good advocate, but I wasn't good enough. I didn't know the right questions and I didn't know to dig my feet in and to stay there and to say, you know, he really doesn't seem right. And, you know, you're going to have to throw me out or whatever it is, but he doesn't seem right. So um, to, how to go about joining up with it is to go on our website at nsepsis.org and you'll find all the information there. Great, thank you. And Roger, we'll put that into the chat box for folks. And Al, how can folks get involved in New York, whether they be organizational or individual? Thanks, Greg. I, I think one of the one of the first and, and probably the priority things they should do is, is work to educate themselves about this. Uh, visit the NSEPSIS site, look at the resources, um, support the organization. Uh, you know, one of the things that that's very, very, very uh, heavily motivating is going through the resources, the videos, the, um, you know, the, the background that's provided uh, on these sites. Also, uh, uh, the Sepsis Alliance site as well is full of resources. Uh, so I think that's really important. If you're an agency or you work in an agency of any sort, look to see what your organization might be doing or is not doing as it relates to this issue. Have you ever discussed it internally? Is Have you adopted sort of your own charge about how to increase awareness across your clientele? More formally, if you have a relationship with, with a hospital, in particular with a hospital, many of them have a sepsis committee, you know, uh, 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 create a connection with that committee so that there's a flow of information. What do you see that could be valuable in the population that you address? What do they see? What's important for you to know? So those, those are some very important things as it relates to us. If you, if you, uh, we have a, we have a, uh, an email address, it's sepsistool.org. And I think Roger will put that in the, uh, in the resources later. If you have a question for us or how you can be involved specifically in our efforts um, to promote sepsis awareness, prevention, screening, treatment, uh, send us a note in there and we would love to work with you individually. Um, we did we did a uh, summit in the middle of June and Kieran and Orleth were both there. Greg, you were uh, also a featured uh, a keynote presenter at that. After that summit and after an education session that we did, we received a, 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 a outreach from two hospital systems in the state. Each one of them was interested not only in the home health line, but in how they could address sepsis across all their lines of service. That's the kind of thing that we really need to work to try to achieve. And again, I would invite anyone in the provider community to reach out uh, in that way. But I think really ultimately for any individual, uh, in, in addition to informing yourself, be an ambassador. As Karen had said, use that word. Uh, you know, how many times a day are, are you in, in a situation where just raising that word might raise enough consciousness that, that in fact saves a life? I, I mean, I can tell you that, that we have members of our team here who are laypersons, who are not necessarily uh, in the medical field themselves, but who have become educated, have alerted many, many people about this and, and, and actually identified uh, uh, risk patients who are at risk. They, they, they've advised them. They've gone to the ER. They said, I think it might be sepsis and it's bad. So it's not something that, you know, again, that, that should be elusive for anybody, whether you are a health professional or whether you, you are, you are general within the system, know the signs, know the symptoms and be a good ambassador. Yeah, we're going to keep, you know, we, uh, I know Sepsis Awareness Month is September for our agency. It's every month of the year that we do something at least twice a month to continue to educate people. And I thank you guys. We have a few minutes left, so I'm going to ask Roger to open it up for a couple of questions. Yep, we have a few questions that have come in. A lot of them have been about uh, the signs and symptoms, which have already been addressed. But maybe one piece that hasn't been addressed yet is prevention. Uh, how do you prevent sepsis? And I think that's an important point to, to get across. Or not, you want to go now? Yeah, sure. Um, well, there, there are many ways that you can prevent sepsis. Um, it's very important, obviously, if you have a wound to keep it clean. 
Um, it's very important if you have a temperature to think infection and where might the infection be from. It's very important to, to be vaccinated um, in order to prevent infection. Um, I'm, off the top of my head, I'm just wondering, is there anything I'm missing in that? Um, I, I would say I think it's important to be very timely. If you suspect an infection, don't ignore it. Don't say, well, it'll go away in a day and sort of put your shirt sleeve down. You know, that's very important. I would say, too, washing that... Washing your hands. Yes, washing your hands. I mean, all those are based... Yes. I mean, one of the things yeah. that we really try to emphasize in the health community is to is to uh, be in evaluating patients, always look at whether there's a source site or a potential source site of an infection or an active infection and take steps there. We're also working with the CDC to train uh, people in the field uh, on infection prevention in their own practices, as well as to work with patients to try to um, uh, educate them about it. Yeah, and I just want to reiterate for, for Rory, it was a scratch on the elbow. And so we just think about all of our daily lives and whatever we're doing, where we wind up looking down, at least I do it, my hands, I have no idea where the blood is coming from, because I don't even remember, you know, cutting myself or getting scratched or what have you. So, you know, to, uh, you're talking about just simple hygienic things. And then if there is like a fever or, or something after that, you know, try to go from A to B pretty quickly, and then how, how quickly it is to, to, get, uh, to get help. Um, Roger, uh, any other questions? Yeah, there's a question about treatment protocol. So what happens for treatment? Well, there's, there's a, there's a, there are specific treatment protocols, you know, in the hospitals um, uh, for uh, application of, uh, of antibiotics, um, uh, you know, and IV fluids. Um, there, there, there's a, there's a uh, actual bundles um, that, um, that the department, um, you know, uh, uh, requires and encourages hospitals to, to utilize. Karen or Orleff, I don't know if you want to speak further okay. to that. Sure. that issue. No, I think, um... It's as you said, antibiotics, treatment of anti with antibiotics of an infection um, and uh, IV fluids, and then uh, treatment of low blood pressure when that occurs also. And there, as Al said, there, there are protocols that they should be following in the hospitals. I think one of the problems is, is that is that by the time the individual gets to the hospital, yeah. often they've they've already become very severely compromised. Mm -hmm. So you know they're they're in respiratory failure, renal failure, all kinds of other uh, 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 you know physical catastrophes that that are then going to require simultaneous treatment really to save their lives. You know, uh, be, uh, being ventilated, uh, going into coma. I mean, all of those things are accompanying this. Amputations, there's something like, what, 38 amputations a day uh, due to this. Uh, and it, Marla said, sometimes to maintain the blood pressure, and there's the application of vasopressors, and then what, what ultimately happens is the blood supply is cut off to the extremities, and individuals lose limbs. Um, and, and so again, it's when we talk about treatment, it's, it's, a, it's, 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 it's everything from what can you do early to prevent and treat when it's most able to be treated, uh, uh, best for the patient, best for the whole system versus an individual who is now crashing in the ER or now been admitted to critical care and everything's kicked into the gear to save their life. If, if I could just jump in on the end of that for, for parents or professionals with children especially, it's helpful to remember one thing, sepsis is the largest killer of children in the world. That's the that's the wake up that I forgot to mention earlier is that in case you're wondering what is the chance of killing my child or this patient or this loved one. The, the other thing I meant to say is that for any of those things that people want on our website, they can download them. They can get the video. There are public um, announcements and all that. So if people are looking for anything uh, throughout the, from from coast to coast. Sepsis is the same killer internationally. It's the same thing. It's the same prevention. And that, I think, is important, is that whether you're the parent, hopefully you're not in our shoes, or the professional, and there's any question whatsoever, what is the largest killer of children in the world? It's sepsis. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. I'm, I'm really glad that you had, had raised that. And I think that from some of the testimonials on, on advertising this. And, you know, we talked about that today, that this is, this is something to take abundantly seriously.
differently. Yeah. And if it scares you, then I, I think that we did what we wanted to do today. Um, this is an equal opportunity killer. It kills hundreds of thousands of people um, and probably millions worldwide. Thanks to your guys' leadership, uh, tens of thousands of lives have been saved because of the unfortunate beyond unfortunate, there's no words to describe, um, you know, what you had to go through. And, you know, uh, Karen and Orloth and Allie, I cannot thank you enough for um, all that you do for bringing us into the loop on this. And, um, you know, we're continue to be excited to do whatever we can uh, to continue to get the word out um, and, and help save some lives. But I, I just want to thank the three of you for, for really all, all that you do on this. And for anybody who's listening, the resources are there, they're free. It's not overly complicated to spend a couple of minutes to educate yourself on the signs and symptoms that could save your life, the life of a loved one, uh, your children, uh, whomever. So again, I wanna thank you guys for joining us. Uh, Roger, as always, thanks for uh, the production and the behind the scenes, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Al. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, uh, Greg. I just want to say too that um, you know we are you know in this process we're 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 the disciples. I thank the Stauntons for their leadership and the privilege of of really working us of being able to work with them. And you 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 are really of any aging commissioner in the country. You are by far the leader in this area. So thank you for all that you do. Well, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Good job. Well done. God bless.